Right-wing Leninism, isn't that a little contradictory? Yes, it is, my dear viewer, but only if you think of the purpose of Leninism as establishing communism in Russia, and we at the court sense are not really into that. But if you look at Leninism as a strategic doctrine that can be used to achieve political success for a specific ideology, there is much that we can learn from the old Bolshevik. Especially because it is simply a reality that today the strongest support base of the right wing is to be found in the working class, which was once the socialist support base. Therefore, the problem that the socialist movement faced at the end of the 19th century is the same one that the right-wing populist movements are facing right now. That is, that the average person is docile and disinterested in political action. Despite the relative indifference of the Russian people to his movement, Lenin ended up succeeding against all odds and got his revolution by organizing what he called a vanguard party. So I do believe that there is much that the modern right wing can learn from the most successful revolutionary of the 20th century. But the first thing that this essay must do is to find what Leninism is. So we will begin by looking at the historical context of the socialist movement in the late 19th century and how Leninism developed in practice during the Russian Revolution and the subsequent civil war. It is important to understand that Leninism is not your classical orthodox Marxism. Instead, it is a revisionist movement that challenges many of the main tenets and beliefs of orthodox Marxism and led to much controversy at the time. Indeed, it led to a major split of the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party between the Mensheviks and the Bolsheviks. Leninism and its mirror movement, Democratic Socialism, both rose as a result of a deep crisis in the communist movement that happened during the 1890s and bitterly divided the Second Internationale. This crisis was the result of the failure of Marxist predictions about how the revolution would take place and where it would take place. Marx died in 1873 and his ideas had already become mainstream in the socialist movement. But to understand this crisis, we have to talk a little bit about Marxist theory. The simplified version is that Marx argues that the politics of a society are the expression of its inner contradictions, which eventually lead to a synthesis of these contradictions, to a new political system. He claims that capitalism arises from, from feudalism and that the contradictions of capitalism will inevitably give rise to socialism and to a classless communist society. The main contradiction of capitalism, according to Marx, was the struggle between the capitalists and the workers. As capitalism advanced, Marx predicted that the wealth would be concentrated in the hands of fewer and fewer people, while the rest of society would live under worse and worse conditions. Therefore, at a certain point, there would be so few capitalists and so many miserable proletarians with nothing to lose, that capitalism would simply collapse under its own weight. So, by extension, Marx predicted that socialism would first arise in the countries that have advanced capitalism, such as England, France, and Germany. This put Russian socialists in a difficult position because their country was still pretty much feudal, agrarian, and capitalism was barely beginning to take root. According to Marx, since socialism could only arise as a result of capitalism, Russia was not ready for revolution. The problem is that by the 1890s, the Marxist prediction that capitalism would crumble under its own weight was simply not happening. Instead, the opposite was the case. Working conditions were improving. This created a fundamental split in the socialist movement between those who believed that the workers' interests could be best achieved by reforming the system from within and those who still believed the revolution was necessary even if conditions improved. Within the revolutionary side, there was another crisis which Lenin addresses in what is there to be done. This crisis was that since the workers' material conditions were improving, they were becoming less and less interested in violent revolution, contradicting Marx's prediction that the revolution was both inevitable and that it would be carried out by the workers themselves. To summarize, Vladimir Lenin had two major problems. First, that Russia was not yet capitalist and therefore was not ready for socialism. And second, that the revolution was not even happening by itself in the places where Marx had predicted. 
Leninism is the ideology that arises to solve these two problems within Russian socialism. The Bolsheviks were going to solve these two problems by establishing a vanguard party made up of professional revolutionaries that would seize power and establish a socialist worker state since the workers would not do it themselves. It is important to note that Lenin's rationale of why the revolution was not being carried out by the workers themselves is that, according to him, socialism was simply too complicated for the average worker to understand, and therefore class consciousness could only come from the educated intelligentsia. Quote, we have said that there could not have been social democratic consciousness among the workers. It would have to be brought to them from without. The history of all countries shows that the working class, exclusively by its own effort, is only able to develop trade union consciousness, i.e. the conviction that it is necessary to combine into unions, fight the employers, and strive to compel the government to pass necessary labor legislation. The theory of socialism, however, grew out of the philosophic, historical, and economic theories elaborated by educated representatives of the property classes, by intellectuals. By their social status, the founders of modern scientific socialism, Marx and Engels, themselves belong to the bourgeois intelligentsia." Unquote. What is there to be done? Page 18. Quote, Working class consciousness cannot be genuine political consciousness unless the workers are trained to respond to all cases of tyranny, oppression, violence, and abuse, no matter what class is affected, unless they are trained, moreover, to respond from a social democratic point of view and no other. Unquote. What is there to be done? Page 42. Lenin's vanguard party would be made up of socialist intellectuals that would bring on the revolution even if the workers did not want it and even if Russia was not ready, according to orthodox Marxism. I would argue that it was exactly this vanguard party that allowed the Bolsheviks to act decisively in the chaotic years between the February Revolution and the end of the Civil War, when their opponents were divided and unsure of what to do. Of course, there was a military component to the Reds' victory in the Russian Civil War. But in my opinion, the factors that led to a Bolshevik victory all have their sources in their efficient political efforts. Their low degree of popularity in the election of 1917, 23%, at the beginning of the revolution was not a limiting factor because they were able to attract millions to their cause through propaganda and conscription. The result of this is that they were able to field an army many times the size of their rivals, and they also managed to purge all the other political parties despite being outnumbered in both most of the workers' councils, the Soviets, and in the Constituent Assembly that was elected in the previously mentioned election. Indeed, the Bolsheviks dissolved the assembly within a day and declared one-party rule, and all the other parties just had to take it, and indeed they did. The reason that their opponents were not even able to defend themselves is that they had no political unity or coordination. On one hand, you have the leftist factions, which were fragmented around different dysfunctional parties, such as the Mensheviks and the SRs. These political parties held great popular support, as seen in the election of 1917. But since they were fragmented into many small factions, they were politically paralyzed by infighting. Some wanted to oppose the Bolsheviks by force, others within their own parties opted for peaceful resistance, and some even for working with the Bolsheviks. Both of their efforts were rewarded with eventually getting shot. On the other hand, the white movement was never truly unified, either politically or militarily. Some fought for the Tsar, others for the Republic, and others for themselves. This crippled their political efforts and sabotaged any chance that they had at victory. After all, their armies, the white armies, were known, with the exception of maybe Wrangel's army, were known for corruption and desertion. Thus, the Russian Civil War ended with a red victory because there were no real opponents. And before anybody accuses me of being a fervent communist, I still do think that the triumph of the Bolsheviks was a great tragedy that broke Russia in more ways than one, and she is still not recovered. In my opinion, Lenin should be regarded with respect, the same type of respect that one might give to, I don't know, Genghis Khan. You do not have to think that Genghis was a nice guy to appreciate his mastery as a general. The same should apply to Lenin because he was the professional revolutionary of the 20th century. But the most important thing to take from the whole history of Bolshevism 
was that there were two separate strategies used by the different socialist movements. The orthodox Marxists were expecting that the revolution would come from a spontaneous rising of the masses. The Leninist strategy was based on having a, prof a core of professional revolutionaries that would organize the revolution. For the purposes of this essay, we will call these two strategies populism and vanguardism, respectively. Indeed, I believe that it is possible to categorize every single political movement in history into one of these two categories. Either the movement is made up of an organized minority and it and is administered from a top-down style, or it relies on the popularity of the masses and is run from a bottom-up style. We have already discussed Lenin's version of the Vanguard Party, but we can see that there have been many other movements with a vanguardist strategy. Vanguardism is only the principle that organization, not popularity, is the way to political power. Vanguardist movements have a party line that does not change according to what the crowd wants. Instead, it comes from the leadership, not the people. One can spot a vanguardist movement by two characteristics, organization and a defined ideology. Essentially, most political movements throughout history have been vanguardists. Some examples besides the Bolsheviks are the Sons of Liberty and the American Revolution, the Bonapartists and the French one, the SPD and the, and the early Weimar Republic and the NSDAP and the late Weimar Republic, and finally, modern progressivism is also, I believe, a vanguardist movement. The populist strategy believes that it can achieve power by riding the waves of popular discontent to the point that the masses will desire change and will bring this change by the ballot or by a general uprising. This strategy has been used by many other groups other than the orthodox Marxists. For example, this is also the strategy of people like Bernie Sanders, Mélenchon or, or Sarah Wagenknecht on the left and by Nixon, Reagan, Le Pen and Donald Trump on the right. Populist movements can be easily recognized because they are the opposite of vanguardist ones. They are decentralized and do not have a well-defined ideology because the crowd does not have a well-defined ideology. But instead, the crowd has issues that they care about and symbols that they love or hate. The populist political strategy relies on there being a moment where public dissatisfaction reaches a critical mass, where the common people have had enough and they will turn against the current system, be that capitalism, the swamp or whatever. So in that sense, the populist right wing does find itself in the same position as the socialist parties in 1890, attempting to secure power by waiting for the moment where the people have had enough and riding this wave into political power. The socialists relied on the workers who have had enough of capitalism, while the Trump, the AFD, the FN, etc. relies on millions of voters coming out to vote because they have had enough of inflation, immigration, wokeness, and the, and the like. These ideologies of these two movements, of course, are completely different. Socialists and right-wing populists have very little in common, but they share the same strategy. The issue is that one is hard-pressed to mention a single bottom-up populist movement that has been successful in the long run. The great weakness of the populist strategy is that it is very difficult to translate the waves of popular support into actual political power or policy changes. For example, in the case of immigration, one can observe stable majorities of people in Western countries who express the desire to take in less immigrants. But yet, this majority opinion is not reflected in the actual policies of most Western countries. In fact, the anti-immigration sentiment was even more pronounced when Enoch Powell uh, pronounces opposition to immigration in 1968. According to the polling, as much 75% of the public agreed with him. And what was Enoch Powell able to achieve with this amazing wave of popularity? Uh, he got fired the next day. The public is docile precisely because they get easily bored and are by nature disorganized. Vanguardism succeeds because it is by nature active, while populism is inherently reactive. Populist energy comes from popular dissatisfaction. It reacts to the problems that a population faces. In a society where there are no pressing issues, populist movements have a hard time getting traction, while in times of crisis they grow exponentially. A reactive movement is just anti-something, anti-capitalist, anti-immigration, anti-communist, etc. Therefore, its strength and popularity depends on the thing that it is opposing, not in the movement itself. 
while a vanguardist movement does not rely on the changing currents of popular opinion because it does have a positive vision. Without this positive vision, organization is impossible because no one will be able to or willing to dedicate their lives to the mission of a political movement if they do not believe in it. In order to have a positive vision, to have political initiative, a movement must have a defined and persuasive ideology. However, different ideologies will attract different types of people. A populist ideology is made to attract millions of average people. This means that their ideas must be no more complex than the plot of a Marvel movie. The cost of this popularity is that without a complex ideology, the movement will only attract naive commoners who are genuinely devoted to the cause and clever opportunist politicians and grifters who see an opportunity but do not believe in the movement. Many such cases. What is there to be done then? Modern right-wing movements are nowhere near having 75% of popular support for their policies. And even if they did, would, turn, would things turn out differently than they did for Enoch Powell? I don't think so. There is no solution to the problem of mobilizing the public because it is simply not possible. The reason why I am writing this essay is that I simply do not believe that populism can win against vanguardism. In other words, I do not believe that the right wing, as it stands today, can win. Some might call me a doomer or whatever, but I think that my pessimism is justified when you see the track record of the political right wing in the last uh, 150 years and of populist movements in general. I believe that the person that is not negative when faced with overwhelming odds is an idiot, but the person that gives way to despair, who becomes a doomer, is a coward. Therefore, I propose the application of vanguardist principles, of Leninist principles, to the modern right wing. Lenin gave up on the idea of populism, on the idea that the commune people would topple capitalism by themselves, and instead focused on creating a movement made up of committed intellectuals to carry out the revolution. Right-wing Leninism must do this exact same thing. This means giving up on the idea that populism and that the average people will one day rise against the system and embracing the idea that political change can only come from a group of professional revolutionaries. An effective vanguardist movement needs to be made up of people who are ambitious, intelligent, and who actually believe in their own ideology. This clearly requires a complex ideology that promises to solve society's problems. An ideology like this is nothing less than crack for intellectuals, and a movement like this will be made up of some of the most talented people in a society. This was certainly the case with Marxism-Leninism. One can say many things about the results of communism, but one cannot argue that it was not a seductive ideology that managed to capture some of the smartest minds of the 20th century, at least the early 20th century. The biggest problem of the modern right wing is that it does not have such an ideology. Its different factions are unorganized and agree on very few things. In my opinion, there is only one solution to this, that is to create such an ideology. But... I cannot say what this new ideology will be, and since I am no prophet, I do not get to decide how history will be made. That is someone else's job. The idea of reviving a dead ideology is not realistic. An ideology is the expression of a world feeling or a zeitgeist of a specific time. This means that we cannot pretend to belong to another time and culture. Sadly, I cannot become a Bronze Age Scythian. I was born in post-modernity and cannot become pre-modern, and neither can you. So, to end this essay, I will make a short list of characteristics that an effective vanguardist ideology will need to embody. Okay, number one, this ideology must be intellectually challenging. There can be no future for the slop that makes up most of the right-wing discourse on Twitter. Sure, it can be funny, sometimes, but at the end of the day, it is entertainment that will fade away in a week. Who will remember Schneeko or Fuentes in 20 years? How many remember Anita Bryant today? Nobody intelligent will dedicate their life uh, to an ideology that is frankly retarded. Therefore, this ideology must be something robust. For comparison, the collected works of Lenin make up around 20,000 pages of theory. 2. It must be a philosophical movement. 
as I have written in other essays. I believe that to only focus on politics is to only focus on the means and not on the ends. Therefore, a successful movement must base all its ethical judgments on philosophical foundations, or it will have no depth and will not be able to create this positive vision of how society should work. Any ideology that does not incorporate philosophy and lacks a defined ethical system is by definition slop. Furthermore, one of the largest problems that both millennials and Zoomers face is a crisis of meaning. Any ideology that can give meaning will have and must have depth. 3. This ideology cannot be a religious movement. Such a new ideology can incorporate and respect religious tradition. It can even provide an important part of its philosophy, but I believe that any future ideology cannot be an explicit religious movement. Everywhere you see established religion is in a state of crisis. To embrace one specific religion means burdening the movement with the dogmas and the problems that this religion currently has. Furthermore, that will also alienate the members of all other religions and denominations, as well as the increasing percentage of people who are secular. 4. An ideology cannot be created by a single person. The development of all the major ideologies of the 20th century rest on the shoulders of dozens of people who dedicated their lives to their development. Again, socialism offers a good example. Many people think that oh, communism was created by Marx. But what is Marx without Babeuf, without Fourier, and without Hegel? And as we saw in the first part of this essay, socialism certainly did not end with Marx, or with Lenin for that matter. If right-wing vanguardism will one day become a reality, it will be the result of dozens of people working together to create it. My hope with this project is to one day be a small part of that process, no matter how small my contribution might be. Thank you for your time.